What is going on, everyone? Welcome to another very exciting episode right here on the My Gardener channel. In today's episode, I thought it'd be kind of fun to just kind of bring you guys along and show you the garden cleanup, show you the process of how I get the garden ready to go for the season. There's, you know, not that much to do this time of year. We're kind of just getting, just barely getting into the planting season. So we just direct sown a few things, um, some root crops, some leafy greens and whatnot. But uh, we have to get the rest of the garden ready to go because it won't be long before we're planting tomatoes and peppers and our other main season crops. And so I need to get the garden ready. And a lot of times we'll show things that are aspirational and motivational or we'll show things that are educational. But rarely do we show kind of the, the ugly side of the garden, which is the side that it is in right now. And that's the side that I need to get it out of, which is the kind of the fall and winter phase. So I should have done this in the fall. Usually, I am not that big of a procrastinator. I like to be proactive. I like to get the garden cleaned up and ready to go. But I'll tell you, the past couple of years, I've been a little bit procrastination-y. And so, uh, so I gotta stop being procrastination-y and I gotta, get off, uh, I gotta get off my butt and get some work done. So uh, I thought it'd be fun to bring you guys along, just kind of do the garden cleanup, show you how we get it from the ugly state that it's in right now to the beautiful state that it is when you guys see it usually in our videos. So uh, yeah, let's go. I just got done cleaning up the, uh, the, the tomatoes here. This is a kind of the biggest thing. It's kind of an eyesore. Um, I've got the peppers to clean up next. I got to pull out the kale. I also want to kind of loosely dig some of the soil. Um, there's usually a couple inches of cake. They call it cake. Uh, it's not actually cake you want to eat, I wish. Um, it's just the first like one or two inches of soil that kind of creates a, a hard compacted layer over winter. I got to get that worked up, re-amended with some compost. So there's a lot to do. So let's go. So I'm pulling out the kale. I know a lot of you are probably crying inside because this kale was not yet dead. And I mean, it's not, I mean, you could, you could eat it, but to be honest, it's not that great. It's really woody. It's starting to get pretty, uh, pretty mature. It would have grown some more probably, but I'm of the mindset where like I'm not saving seeds from this. That's the only reason why I'd really leave it in the garden super long over winter is if I was saving seeds because then it would flower this year. But because I'm going to replant all of this stuff out anyways, I'm just going to pull it all out. Some of the kale did not survive the winter. Some of the least like lesser cold hardy varieties did not survive this lacinato. Usually, ugh, usually does not survive the winter. So uh, this one's coming out. But uh, the, the, the blue curled scotch kale really does survive pretty well. And so uh, those ones actually, without any protection at all, survived. All right, so it's one bed down, pretty much good. I'm gonna leave all this other like, kind of like small leaf stuff in here. By the time we start planting in the spring, it'll be broken down. The worms will come in and break the rest of that down. But this bed looks a whole lot better. And uh, I know you guys are probably wondering where all this stuff is gonna go. Most of it's gonna go to the compost pile. It kind of just sits there for most of the summer, kind of slowly breaks down. Ideally, it'd be in smaller pieces, so it breaks down faster. But um, you know, I'm not gonna sit here and mulch this up. I'd rather just let it sit for a whole season or so. And eventually it will break down and turn into nutrients that I can give back to my garden, which is great. But uh, yeah, but this bed here is ready to go. And I know a lot of you also ask about like, you know, do we practice tilling or no-till and the difference between them. We've done a lot of videos on till versus no-till, but when it comes to what we're doing here is basically we're just roughing up this top basically one inch of soil to break up what's called the cake layer. And that cake layer really just prevents the soil from breathing. It prevents the, uh, the nutrients that we're gonna add in the form of fresh compost from moving down throughout the soil. And it really acts as kind of a barrier so that when it rains, the rain, you know, the water that builds up runs away from the soil and carries with it precious nutrients and topsoil rather than percolating down through the soil. So it's really important to kind of break that, that top cake layer up 
even if you're practicing no-till agriculture, like which, uh, which is what we practice here in the garden, we still want to make sure that we are uh, kind of loosely agitating that top layer so that it kind of becomes more homogenous with the other soil that we're gonna add later. All right, so now we're gonna start cleaning up the pepper bed and I still got some more tomatoes over here to clean up. And that leads me to another common question you guys ask, which is, are you ever worried about diseases on things like peppers and tomatoes when you compost them getting transmitted to, uh, to future crops? And the answer is no, not really. Um, when it comes to things like blight, when it comes to powdery mildew, I've said this a lot, and that's that there's a lot of misconceptions about it. There's already blight spores found in the soil. There's already powdery mildew uh, spores found in the soil. Those diseases are soil-borne funguses that are found in the, or fungi, found in the soil. And when water splashes from the soil onto leaves, that's where you get it. It's not from your practicing crop rotation. It's not from, um, it's not from taking all of this plant material and burning it as if it's you know, the spawn of Satan. It's not going to do anything different. If you compost it, if you burn it, if you let this bed sit barren and never grow, uh, a squash plant or um, you know a pepper plant or a tomato plant you can let this sit barren for five seven years you plant uh, you plant a tomato plant in it on the seventh year you're still going to have blight at some point and that's because it's found in the soil it's found in the soil it's not found on your plants first it's found in the soil first and so because you are a part of the earth and blight spores are on basically every part of this earth as well it's definitely high time we come to that realization that it's more about keeping healthy plants and preventing it than it is about completely reducing it because that's impossible. So um, when it comes to the lavender and stuff in the bed, those are perennials. We don't pull those up, obviously. Those are gonna regrow. What we do do is we cut them back. So um, I don't have any pruners with me right now, but I'm gonna come back with some pruners and we're basically gonna take all of this, this dead growth here that I can basically just break away with my hand. That's how dead it is. But it'll save a lot of time and it'll be a lot cleaner just to prune it. But it's really important that we prune back our lavender so that I completely just missed. If you didn't see that, the wind just <laughs> blew it away. But it's super important that we prune away all that dead material because what it does is it cuts down on disease so that um, when, the, when the new growth starts growing, there's less constriction of airflow. There's a lot more uh, airflow that's allowed to get to the plant. It's gonna dry things out. It's gonna prevent things like, like center rot, which is where basically the center of the plant starts to die back. It's gonna prevent things like powdery mildew um, because the leaves are prone to powdery mildew. Um, it's going to help encourage more future growth, more future flowering. So it's really important we come in and just take all that, all that dead growth out. And like I said, I mean, you can basically just pull it off, no problem at all, but I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna prune it up nice and really just kind of shape it up so that it's better suited for growing once it does start growing. So uh, that's the perennials. I'm also gonna come in, I'm still gonna reduce all that caking on the top layer just like I did before. I'm just gonna work around and because I'm only damaging, not really damaging, I'm only disturbing I would say, the top one inch of soil, um, it's not really gonna affect those deeper roots on these perennials and in fact, it's going to allow the nutrients that I'm gonna add through fertilizing and top dressing, it's gonna allow those nutrients to move throughout the soil faster to access the roots that are deeper on these perennials. So it's only a positive thing. Now normally you guys, I would also pull out these stakes, but because we're gonna to put tomatoes back in the same place, I'm just gonna save myself time and not pull them out. And that leads me to another question you guys ask me a lot, which is crop rotation. Why don't you crop rotate, Luke? Well. The answer is because I don't believe in crop rotation on a home scale. I know, don't bring your pitchforks, put them away. I'll explain why. When it comes to the home scale, you have the ability to refresh your soil basically 100% with new soil. You could take all the soil out and put brand new soil in if you wanted to. You could replace 50% of it with fresh compost. When in reality, all you really need to do is replace about 10% of it, refresh 10% of the overall volume of your soil with either fresh compost, bagged compost, whatever that may be, so that it is revitalized. And that is all you're doing with crop rotation. As I said, when it comes to things like diseases, a lot of those diseases are already found in your soil and moving a plant over 10 feet is not gonna reduce things like pest pressure. If the pests were there last year, 
chances are they'll still be present this year. And season to season, those things change. But you're not growing on a 500 acre monoculture where you're growing one crop and you're depleting the soil massively over that, you know, for that one crop. You're not pillaging the soil for all it's worth, spraying it with heavy chemicals, and then getting, you know, having a disease come in or a pest come in that's resistant to those chemicals. So you have to up the ante even more. And then you end up getting to a point where you say, okay, I have to let the land rest. Otherwise, this is like a game of chicken and I'm gonna lose the game. So in a home garden scale, you have so much more control that you know, moving the crop five feet is not gonna make a big difference. You can replenish the soil equally. You can fertilize the soil and remineralize the soil just as easily. And so when it comes down to it, I do not crop rotate at all. I basically think about what I wanna plant, where I wanna plant it, and I just do what I wanna do. And it's easier that way. All right, so the final thing in this bed that I wanna do before I kinda of rake it clean and stuff and get that refreshed is I got my, my walking onions. The walking onions look absolutely amazing this year. They're so healthy but uh, they have all their old flower stalks, which look crazy. These things look like horns on like a, on like a big deer or something, like an antelope or something. They're nuts. So um, I'm gonna pull all these up here. These are just old flower stalks. Now, these I absolutely advocate removing, and that's because these things are hollow, and they, because they're a nice, beautiful, hollow cavity, this can absolutely be a home for things like pests and stuff. So I certainly will remove these and get them out of the garden. And also just obviously makes it look cleaner and nicer, but these super nice big hollow stems are places where bugs love to hide. So I'm gonna get them removed and out of the garden as well. So, and that's about it for this bed. I'll tell you what, this is probably one of my least favorite jobs in the garden. It is not fun by any means, but uh, <laughs> someone's got to do it. But uh, I had to show you something. Check this out. Come in close. This is what it means to have really nice soil. I want to show you what this stuff looks like. It is just a dream come true. I think you guys are really going to love this. All right, so this is soil that was put in about five, six years ago. We started with basically pure compost and essentially even after five years, look at this stuff. Now this is many years of revitalization, doing what we're doing right now, which is basically just raking it clean, adding fresh compost on top. But you can see, look at this. Look at how loose this soil is. There's no, no making this stuff up. I mean, there's potting mix I've thrown in here. There's bags of pro mix I've thrown in here. There's compost I've thrown in here. There's just years of adding fresh, beautiful, high quality soil to this bed. And that's why, that's why you guys always ask me, Luke, how does your oregano grow so crazy? It's just because the soil itself started out great. And then year after year that oregano grows up, it dies, it drops little bits of, little bits of plant material that the worms come up and they feed on. And then it just turns into, I mean, just, oh my gosh, this bed right here, though it's my least favorite bed in terms of maintenance, cause it's, the oregano has become such a nightmare in this bed. It is one of my favorite beds to come and smell because it's just such a perfect example of like, wow, oh, the soil in here is just amazing smelling. And if you are a soil freak like myself, uh, hit the like button. And also let me know in the comments box down below if you yourself love smelling compost. I love, oh my gosh, it just smells so rich and beautiful and there's nothing quite like the smell. So uh, though it's my least favorite bed to clean up, it's my favorite bed to check out because the soil is just so nice. But I had to show you that. And uh, I'm gonna go work on the other uh, oregano bed now. And uh, yeah, you're probably thinking, why do you have two oregano beds? Well, I don't know either. All right, <laughs> time to go clean it up. All right, so that is about it for today. I am thoroughly exhausted. So uh, even though there's a couple more, few little things left to do, a couple more beds to kind of poke and twist and rake, I'm gonna leave those for another day because as they say, Rome was not built in a day and uh, neither is your garden cleanup. So if you're someone that is procrastinated like myself, don't worry, you're in good company. And uh, if you're someone that got it all done in fall, hey, well, congratulations. I hope I can be more like you someday. But uh, so I'm gonna wrap this up pretty soon here 
and, uh, and go in and get some water and take a good, well-deserved nap. But I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you learned something new. If you did, make sure to throw a like up there. Subscribe if you haven't already. And also, make sure to comment down below with something you learned or enjoyed. And uh, maybe also something you're looking forward to, to seeing on this channel. I'd love some content ideas from all of you. So, as always, this is Luke from the My Gardener channel, reminding you to grow bigger. Take care, guys. Bye.